you literally got sober around the holidays. Yeah, I was in treatment. Holidays can be triggering things for people. Five different strategies to help people stay sober, planning ahead and having an exit strategy, communicating with loved ones, bringing your own non-alcoholic drinks, leaning on your support and creating new sober friendly activities and traditions. I'm Flint Anderson, founder of Pain, parents and addicts in need. I've been in recovery since 2001 and there isn't much I don't know about recovery. And my mission is to constantly tell the truth about addiction to make the realities of addiction, recovery, and drug culture known, and to drive awareness and advocate change that ultimately saves lives. And I'm Jason Lachance, a certified recovery coach with a passion for speaking with others and sharing their knowledge to help others seek recovery and maintain long-term sobriety. And this is the Don't Hide the Scars podcast, presented by Pain, Parents and Addicts in Need. Jason Lachance, media director for Parents and Addicts in Need here, and I'm with uh, Julian Carvajal. What is going on, good sir? What's up, man? Two men in recovery. We're going to talk about tips to stay sober for the holidays. It's uh, often a tough times, and you literally got sober around the holidays. Yeah, I was in treatment for uh, Halloween. I got sober on October 16th of 2021. Okay. So I got out of treatment or inpatient treatment like middle of middle of november so like a week or two before thanksgiving and then you know the rest of the holidays followed yeah my original sobriety date and i had a slip up some people say relapse slip up whatever it was was actually on the fourth of july was oh, really? the date. <laughs> um, and then it shifted to ironically uh valentine's day oh, wow. um so, but holidays can be triggering things for people. So we're going to go through five different strategies to help people stay sober, uh, including planning ahead and having an exit strategy, communicating with loved ones. We're also going to talk bringing your own non-alcoholic drinks, which is the thing that I do, uh, le- uh, leaning on your support and creating new sober friendly activities and traditions. So let's start with that plan ahead and exit strategy. What did that kind of look like for you? Because um, you know, my family was pretty supportive. There wasn't, um, per my recollection, some of my first sober holidays for me, you know, there was no family that was bringing alcohol or anything of that nature. But most people don't in- necessarily have that situation. Yeah, thankfully for me too, my family's been very supportive. Neither of my parents drink or use drugs. So um, in my household, it was, it was always a um, clean household. My extended family does drink. Uh, No one else does drugs besides me. I did drugs. Um, So it was really easy. And a a lot of times at family events, we wouldn't have drugs or alcohol because it was at my parents' house and my parents never drank or did drugs in front of me and stuff. Um, But so, I mean, for me, family was really easy, but I did go to parties before. I I remember one specific was a hall. No, no, no a uh, Christmas party for the place I worked at before I got sober, which was Deli Delicious. And my girlfriend worked there as well. So I went to the Halloween part or the Christmas party with her. And, you know, a lot of times at like fast food places and whatnot, a lot of like almost everyone drinks or does <laughs> drugs. So um, I didn't really have an exit strategy per se, even though I was kind of warned by people to have one but i knew for myself like if i got uncomfortable i would just leave and i was there with my girlfriend so i knew and she was very she's always been very supportive so i knew um that she'd be cool with leaving with me if i felt uncomfortable so at that time i had two months of sobriety (laughs) and i was still living in sober living which for me that was always a, a really significant factor of aiding me in staying sober was just knowing that okay, if I get high right now, I'm not going to have somewhere to sleep tonight, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so that was a... Because uh, they tested deterrent. you when you got home, right? Yeah, they tested you. It was like every other day they tested you. Um, and if you spent the night anywhere, there, it was like mandatory. So, But I didn't spend the night that, that time or whatever. It was just for a couple hours I went. Um, but I knew I within the next 48 hours, I'd get drug tested. So I knew within the next 48 hours, if I use, I'm going to be homeless. And what ended up happening was for, there was people drinking, they had a bunch of alcohol and it didn't really trigger me for a while. We were just chilling, 
uh, there was food, so I, we ate. And I knew all these people because I worked with them before. Um, hadn't seen them in like two months because I was I had just got sober. And it was cool for the first like maybe close to an hour because it was Christmas, so we did like a Secret Santa thing yeah, as yeah. well. And then what triggered me was this girl um, started hip, hitting a stizzy, you know, the weed pens. Yeah. And she hit it like right next to me while talking to, it was like a group of girls that were talking. And it, I don't know, it just felt like almost like I was in a trance just staring at the stizzy. And I was like, damn, like it, it would probably taste, I know stizzies taste good. I know like I like, I, I always liked them when I was using. And I started thinking, man, like I, you know, I want to get high. I miss smoking weed. Yeah. And, and that thinking started coming back like, oh weed's not that bad my problem was fentanyl or my problem was cocaine or you know those harder drugs and um you know it made me uncomfortable i started feeling anxious like my heart rate increased and i felt a little uneasy but i thought about like my sober living and i was like I, I i only have two months sober i think i had a little bit less and that was the longest I had ever stayed sober before that was 58 days. So I, I was like, man, I'm not even going to set a new record. Yeah. And I think it was just, I had hit such a low point for me at that, at that time that I still knew I didn't want to try yet. And for me, like, you know, people say one day at a time a lot. And for me, it was just, I don't want to get high right now. Yeah. There's a lot of things I'm, I can't commit to. I still don't commit to being sober the rest of my life. You know, sure. I still don't say like, oh, I'm going to be sober forever. I hope so. That would be yeah. nice. But, yeah. you know, I don't know. Um, but well, for and me, I think it, that's an important thing to accept is, is you know, a thing that made sense to me. You, you can always get drunk tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I would get to tomorrow. And then it would be like, hey, you can always get drunk tomorrow. Yeah. And then eventually it's just now not a thing i've i've you know um if i if and when i've gone to social gatherings people know that i'm sober um you know so that that support is there but i do have situations in which i've chosen to check out you know i have mm -hmm. friends that that own an establishment it's a you know like an upscale wine bar and they do stock with plenty of non-alcoholic drinks went to see a friend of mine play jazz there but at a certain point you know when people were going from i'll have a glass to uh, bring us another bottle it was like, ah, eh, it's deuces, time to check out. And, you know, that was respectfully understood. So um, I think that's just important is, is part of that, the plan ahead and exit strategy is that it really is on us. And that's an exciting yeah. thing. Like, it's our response. Like, wait a minute. I get responsibility now? Yeah. And I get to control something in my life finally. <laughs> right. right. Yeah, because when you're using it, you just feel so out of control. It's, oh, yeah. It's nice to have something like... I get to actually control where I am and what I do. Yeah. I get to control my actions. And that's at um, that story I was telling. Eventually, I did. I felt uncomfortable. People started drinking more and, and continued to smoke weed. And so eventually, I, was, I told my girlfriend, like, hey, I'm, I'm not comfortable. Can we leave? Like, I'm, I'm going to leave. Do you, are you cool if, with coming with me? And because we drove together, obviously. So um, she was like, yeah, that's fine. So she, we said our goodbyes and left. And... Um, it was just knowing that I wish I would have planned ahead, but I, I knew always that I had the option of leaving. Yeah. And that definitely made me feel more in control of myself and that I could say no, you know? Yeah. And it gave me that confidence to be able to say no. And I didn't tell anyone. At the time, I still felt very uncomfortable saying that I was an addict or that I didn't do drugs or that anything. And, uh, you know, they offered me drinks and and to smoke weed and i just said no i'm good you know i gotta drive and that's honestly that's always been my excuse whenever i go to parties and stuff i'm like oh no i'm the i'm driving you know i whenever i show up somewhere i'm always the one driving so well and it's good I and, and i think that's important with the that goes along with this plan ahead and have an exit strategy is you don't owe anyone any in-depth explanation yeah it could be as simple as I'm driving, uh, I'm on antibiotics, whatever people it is. People never care either. Yeah. I was surprised when I first got sober. People really don't care. If you say 
anything they're just like okay yeah. like, most people unless they're like a addict who was trying to get you know like misery loves company unless they're really trying to get someone to use with them because they feel like Shit. themselves they're not going to care what you say they're going to be like all right cool and just yeah. move on you know new perceptions north the premier drug and alcohol treatment and recovery center in central california a full continuum of medically supervised top quality care with programs for detox and patient residential treatment with dual diagnosis intensive outpatient treatment sober living support groups and more new perceptions north provides adult men and women with the highest caliber of professional health care treating each client with compassion and respect in a safe, comfortable environment to begin the process of recovery to proudly create and sustain a life without addiction. Call 559-978-1507 or visit newperceptionsnorth.com. For anyone that's listening, watching early in recovery or loved one of someone is like, give yourself that space to be okay with the fact that, you know, we're people pleasers, most of us that are uh, yeah. <laughs> in recovery to to start learning to set for yourself what does and doesn't work for you again you don't own an explanation you don't own a, owe a story it's as simple as no thank you or i'm driving i'm on antibiotics whatever reason it is that you want to give keep it nice short whatever you don't owe that explanation and i think the more that you exercise that the more beneficial um, it becomes because you've started to develop a skill. You're like, wow, wait a minute. I said no, and, <laughs> yeah. and I'm good, and everything's good. You know, So, so have that. Have a plan. Uh, execute that plan and, and keep the exit strategy. I even tell people, like, if at a point it gets uncomfortable, just leave. You don't owe, like, goodbyes or anything else. At the end of the day, this is your life. Like, you know, you might be like, well, that's rude. Sure, but so would everybody showing up to your funeral. I think that's yeah. even more rude. So yeah. just have it. Just have it. Like, have a plan. It's yeah. simple. It's not daunting. It's as simple as, like you said, I'm driving, I'm on antibiotics, or no thank you, and then know your point of exit much like you. That that ha And luckily you had that person with you. Because I definitely yeah. recommend early in recovery, if you're going to a place... Don't go alone, for sure. Don't go alone. Yeah. So that, that was... Another thing for me, too, was that, you know, I went with my girlfriend. She, I mean, I think she, I've seen her drink five times, you know, so she doesn't, rare, she rarely ever drinks. And um, I think it's very important to have someone with you that supports your recovery, understands what you're going through to a degree, and um, is willing to leave with you when you're ready to leave and is there to, to help basically support you yep. in, in that because I, I didn't want to say like, oh, I can't drink or this or that. And I didn't want to be the, at the time I felt so self-conscious about so many things that even just saying like, I felt like I had to explain why I was leaving or people yeah. would think something's wrong with me, you know? So it was so much easier for her to say, hey, we're leaving. And then yeah. me just say bye to whoever, yeah. you know? Yeah. Well, and I think that's important of, of our second tip to stay sober is that communicating with loved ones, yeah. you, your girlfriend, you know, whomever invites you to the party, whatever it is, just communicate your needs or at least have an individual that you can, you yeah, know, definitely. Um, you know, but, I mean, you're a trial by fire situation because <laughs> for me, if someone asked me if I had a sponsee or somebody I'm doing recovery coaching with and they're like, oh, I got this party, you know, I might converse with them and ask them the why of one, why they want to go. Like, is this a big why? Is, is this like a life and death? You must be there. Like, this isn't a funeral service. This isn't, you know, um, but if they're seem determined, <clears throat> I always just tell them, yeah, make sure that you are in constant contact with someone that you've got yeah. maybe several people. Um, that can be at the ready to kind of answer the phone or or are there and available, whatever it is, because that communication is key. We we as people, no matter what it is, need support, and especially early in in our recovery, it's really fragile. Yeah, yeah. And I think for sure, um, I was just thinking this, having someone that's going to hold you accountable and mm -hmm. and being honest with that person, like, hey, you know, I'm feeling this way or that way, or I need 
you know sometimes you need to tell people to hold you accountable because mm-hmm. they don't know what you need until mm-hmm. you tell them and i have a i have a friend well who, sometimes we don't even know what we need yeah true <laughs> <laughs> i have a friend right now who his family is um big enablers and uh he's been sober for a little over a week and he's he's been in and out several times but he came to me because he's like dude no one holds me accountable i told my mom that no one that she's hurting me because she's not holding me accountable and the mom breaks down crying and he ends up having to like console her but the point is like oh that's bad for him send him my way let me <laughs> yeah. i'll do a recovery coaching with him so for him to tell me like hey i need someone to hold me accountable is a big step and I, now i do you know i've been texting him every day and, and telling him like checking in on him and, and inviting him to hang out and stuff because i know for me it's been helpful even recently you know i've every time i go to a party i i go with someone that i know is will hold me accountable if i try to do something and that alone keeps the thoughts of wanting to use away sure so i don't even feel like um i went to a party several months ago um but i had a quick thought like hey i kind of want to drink just a little bit and then i was thinking Nah, but the people I'm with will like as, if they see something in my hand, they'll be like, "Yo, what? What are you? What are you doing?" Yeah. And just that thought alone immediately takes that out of my mind, you know. And I don't yeah. don't get the craving or any more urge. It's just like a quit split second thought, and it's over. Yeah, no, that's good. And for me, uh, let's jump to our third recommendation here on this is to you know bring your own non-alcoholic drinks. Uh, for instance, I've I never host, heard that one before. That's good. Yeah, I host uh, um, do ring announcing for some MMA events, and oh, wow. you know people are there and they're partying. And after the fact, I literally go in the bartenders. They tend to be the same ones for these events, and I bring three non-alcoholic beers um, because then people don't bother me. No, got something. You know, they, they keep it for me or they know after the fact I'll go up and I'll just get a tonic water with the lime in it. It looks like something else. People come up. I literally will take two sips off of that tonic water, but I'm holding it. No one asks. And when I have been asked is, uh, no, I'm good. Thanks. I'm, no, I'm all right. You know, yeah. so it's any of that stuff that we can do any kind of quick deflection yeah um you know or the offering i'll get oh well, we're gonna do shots no no i'm good or you know even during the event take a shot with me it's intermission i'm like no i gotta stay focused to announce you know <laughs> these are the people that yeah. they don't know me they're coming to have a good time they don't understand that and it's okay yeah. so for me um that's important now yeah you know and and I, i'm one of those people and i don't recommend it for everybody everybody's different that like i genuinely enjoyed the taste of beer so for me you know, having a non-alcoholic uh, beer, you know, I try to get the 0.0 stuff. and um, But it makes me feel like I'm still having, you know, fun as yeah. a part of the party. Or like I said, a tonic water with lime. Um, for me, it's not a trigger. That's an examination yeah. that people have to do. It, it does that smell. You know, some people just wanted to drink for oblivion. Yeah, I was the weird pe- person that, oh, I liked the taste of whatever x alcohol which made it extra worse for me because it's like <laughs> i love the way this tastes yeah, i like the way i'm feeling you know um which it's always funner to get drunk than be drunk yeah. um so for me that was really important you know if i'm in situations then it's very rare now but recently i was around someone that was smoking weed and i just kept my distance now i don't i never per se maybe like how you thought like mm, that wasn't my problem but it was associated with enough problems that, that my brain is corrected enough to be like, mm, no, I'm good. You know? Yeah. Now, for sure, now I think, I know that no matter what it is, any mind-altering substance I'll get addicted to and will eventually lead me to bad things, no mm-hmm. matter what. You know, like, I used to think, oh, if I smoke weed, like, I can just smoke weed and I'll be okay. But then, <laughs> even then, I'm still just a, an idiot. You yeah. know, I'm a slow, I'm like half retarded when I smoke a bunch of weed anyways. And I don't want to be that person anymore. I want to perform at the maximum I possibly can. Yep. And that's why I like, it, it, it's either way it's going to be bad. Either I'm going to just smoke weed and I'm going to be an idiot or it's going to lead me back to harder drugs and I'm going to f- off my life again completely. Yeah. Cause I know that's where it would lead me. Granville home of hope. Here we go again. 2024. We're back. We're 
Granville, Home, Granville Homes is building a, a brand new home. We're going to give it away on December 4th, 2024. You can get your ticket. It's 100 bucks, or you can get a bundle of tickets for 200 which includes the, the chance of winning a brand new Lexus for two years. And uh, Payne will receive 100% of all the proceeds from the tickets that we sell, as well as the eight other nonprofits that are involved with, uh, with, with this event. So uh, you can go to our website, you can find out there how you purchase the tickets. We can't sell the tickets online um, for legal reasons. Um, but other than that, you can call our number, you can uh, reach out to our office and uh, we'll, we'll show you how to get those. So help us out. Uh, if I smoke weed, then it's going to go from a situation from for me to where that was already, always a party related thing. So then I'm going to want to be around more environments that do that. And all I need is that time which in which I'm blazed out of my mind. And then somebody goes, hey, man, here, here's a rum and coke. And I go, but I have no inhibition anymore. And I go, yeah, that just sounds wonderful. Because for yeah. me, I wouldn't go from that one drink. I'd be right back to a 30 pack in a day or two. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. So it's having that that conscious um, understanding of who I am and my love for the booze so much that it's like it's like that crazy love of anything that y y you start to respect it in the fact that me loving that is the worst thing for my life. So <laughs> yeah. I just got to take this thing that I love and just shove it over off to the side. Yeah. So I completely understand where you're coming from on that. Yeah. Let's talk about, um, you know, leaning on your support system. You mentioned it very well that being at that party, um, and I know it was important for me at first too, um, just having maybe an individual that's there that I can talk about if I do have thoughts and feelings coming up. Yeah. Um... Or even just to call me on it, like, yeah. hey, I see you salivating over there while you see somebody <laughs> drinking that rum and coke or something, yeah. you know? I think it's, it's very important, especially people that are close to you. Like, uh, my mother's in recovery, but hearing stuff from her, it just either aggravates me or I just don't want to hear it, you know? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, she always jokes around about it that she'll see or hear someone tell me the exact same thing she told me. And... I basically ignore it when she tells me, but when someone else tells me, I like act on it. And it's it's true. I mean, I don't know what it is. It's just I, you hear things differently from different people at different times. Yeah. And you got to have a vast support system because sometimes you can't hear it from certain people. Sure. You know, like I can hear, I might be able to hear something from my girlfriend that I can't hear from my sponsor or something that I hear from my sponsor that I can't my girlfriend or my mom or my family or whatever yeah well and that's an important uh, another important piece of this that that I really want people to pick up on and hear that as the recovering addict as our consciousness grows especially of ourselves and of these things you know it it, it falls upon us to do the work to to listen better you know some people like at first i didn't want to hear anything from my dad my dad grew up in a home of addiction so i didn't want to hear you know at first yeah. but then when i started to get to a point of realizing huh there's some underlying issues with, with my dad that probably prevent me from being open to the knowledge that and love that he's wanting to share um and that's on me to receive it or not yeah. not them and maybe he doesn't deliver every message in the way that i would like but that's okay for me then to communicate like am i understanding what you're saying like like because i didn't really care for x out of yeah. the whole you know whatever it is um and it's also important to know that for some people there's nothing wrong with letting them understand I don't think you're the one I want to converse with about this or yeah. i have someone that i can converse with about this like the last person I would want to talk with about, you know, the emotions around a relationship uh, now that I'm sober is either of my parents. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, I don't want to talk to you about these things. I don't yeah. want to talk to you about the insecurities that come along with it. Yeah, you know, definitely. for me, booze and women went hand in hand. And now I'm having to deal yeah. with these real feelings that are real, not based on, oh, you're so gorgeous, you know, because I'm blitzed yeah. out of my mind. But like, oh, I really have real emotions here. 
Um, so sometimes, yeah, it, it's okay to examine your support system and and evaluate that as much as it maybe it's a, uh, the intention of the message is loving, that this isn't the person to deliver it. Yeah, definitely. I think it's important that you, you've you touched on it multiple times in, about examining yourself and, and these different relationships. That comes from uh, trials, you know, yeah. testing stuff out. I didn't know how I would react to that specific party when I went. I didn't know how I'd react to being around drugs or alcohol for the first time. You know, a lot of this stuff you have to find out by doing it. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important to have these uh, safeguards in place because you don't know, maybe you don't react at all. Maybe someone drinks right next to you and you feel nothing, you don't care, you barely even notice. Or, you know, you're like freaking out, skin is itchy because you want to drink so bad, (laughs) you know? And it's important to reflect a lot and i think that's the first year of recovery it's really about that because i am such a completely different person now than i was before and you don't realize it immediately you don't realize the change until you've been sober a while and that's why it's important to keep i mean every day examine yourself learn new things about yourself because you're changing but you don't really know who you ever were because the drugs and alcohol are masking who you really are. You're just, you're basically an animal just chasing this high. So you're not like a real person. So it's important to to learn those things. And like you said, with, with different people, my, my grandma, bless her heart. She's, she said some things to me that like make me want to get pissed off at her. (laughs) Like if my mom said it, I'd be super pissed. But because I know she's, almost 90 now but um i know she comes from mexico doesn't speak english right. very traditional Mija. Woman. <laughs> yeah. and so she'll say things that i know the she Mijo, means sorry. it i know she means it like very loving but she'll tell me things like <laughs> she'll, she literally told me when i got sober like just grab your balls man up and and don't do it anymore right. and i was like that's not how it works but <laughs> if I, it was only yeah, that simple if it was only that simple i would have been grabbing my nuts a long time <laughs> right. ago but but i know that she means it very well and that's i mean that's what but that's what my grandfather did sure. he drank alcoholically and then he just stopped because he you know something happened in it and it was detrimental to his relationship with my grandma and basically to save their marriage he completely stopped and from then on he was I mean, he was one of the most pleasant people I've ever met in my life, you know, and I really looked up to him. And my dad was the same way. And he stopped drinking when he met my mom. And I'm just not that person, man. Yeah. I, I, I mean, they they were definitely heavy drinkers, but I don't think they crossed the line into alcoholism. Sure. And I definitely did for Well, a and long that's time. The, the, the interesting thing about alcoholism and some people it it, you know we've got the term substance uh, use disorder and they want to have that override the word addiction because it's more kind the reality is (laughs) some people are just going to abuse substances some people are full-blown addicts yeah like for me i tried some pills and powders not a single one was like anything but boy i could not quit alcohol yeah i just couldn't my brother normie he he can drink like a totally normal like he can purchase yeah. a, I remember it vividly an, an alcoholic drink and he just had half of it and he's just like <laughs> uh, you're gonna drive tonight yeah uh, well I'm I, you know I'm yeah. like that's not even something that could enter my mind because it would be like not only am I gonna finish mine who else didn't finish theirs because I'll drink <laughs> you know and yeah. that's some of the things where people yes they can abuse um a substance and then just stop that's then, totally my older brother like both my brother older brothers um but especially my oldest he i mean he's abused drugs like definitely abused them yeah not i mean he got he had like uh broke his knee while he was in the military and they prescribed him like crazy amounts of percocet and he never took it as prescribed he would just take it like Every couple of days, you just take a bunch of them and to get high, basically. Yeah. And I mean, he's recreationally and medically gotten high 
or used substances, but recreationally got high hundreds of hundred thousands of times probably. And he's done a bunch of different drugs and he'll kind of use heavy for a little while, but then he'll just stop like nothing. Right. And it's like nothing ever happened. He has no issue stopping no matter what he does. He'll do Coke for one weekend and just be done. And I'll see him go months, years without touching stuff. And for him, it's especially just having, this is what I learned from him was having exterior motivators are very helpful to stay sober. Cause for him, he does like boxing. So he, he smokes weed for pain. Um, but he'll smoke weed like two, three months out of the year, like every day, stop for a month or two, and then like just cycle like that. But when he's training uh, for a fight, he'll he won't use anything, bro, like at all. Yeah. And then maybe you know the fight's over, and and he'll do coke for a weekend and drink and whatever. And then that next Monday, bro, back to training, touches nothing. And you know I'm not, I'm not that person. If I yeah. touch anything, I'm I'm going hard for as long as I can. But that motivator is really helpful for me and my sobriety because he's that. That's why I say now I want to f- function at my peak level, yeah. and he's the one who taught me that. And, and that's what I want all the time. Is I don't miss being zonked out, falling asleep, uh, not being able to think properly. Like I, after my first year of sobriety, I really started getting my mental state back. And being able to function properly was like a beautiful thing to me. Yeah. Well, and I think that's why it's important. You know, not everybody's pathway is maybe 12 steps, doing 12 step recovery stuff. Both you and I have do. Yeah. Uh, it, it's helpful for us. Is, is it at the end of the day, no matter what, like the 12 steps is a worthy endeavor. Uh, Absolutely. Counseling is a worthy endeavor. Finding a mentor, all these things are all worthy endeavors because we do need that support system. And, and I think you it, should try all of them. Yeah, it doesn't I, hurt. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the no, more, I'm, the better, I'm big yeah. on try them all. You know, like yeah. I, I say all the time, I used to experiment with chemicals. Now I experiment with with uh, progress in life. Yeah. And what does it mean for me to you know be with it and and present? You know. 365 days a year 24 7 like you know i want my life to be something better doesn't mean i don't struggle i still have confidence issues i still question my abilities i still uh question my worth within my relationship you know all these things it doesn't mean they go away but it's just nothing about those thoughts feelings anything else leads me to want to use anymore it's like not even a thought in my mind like I'm, I've done the work for that just to me. If it does something come up, the thoughts are so fleeting and so quick. Yeah. You know, and I, I think that's a trick and that importance of this holiday season. And maybe 12 steps aren't your thing, but try it for a while. Yeah. Or, or, you know, like, hey, if you have a therapist, guess what? They're probably going to be on vacation. So have someone else yeah. that's maybe more readily available. Maybe it's a sober friend. Maybe they're in 12 steps, but that's not your thing. Uh, whatever it is, like I go to church, maybe somebody at church, whatever it is, just have someone that gets it. You yeah, know, absolutely. Because, because it is. It's such a trying time. So many emotions around maybe why we started to use in the first place or, um, you know, whatever it is. Maybe it's that family member that might be at a gathering, you yeah. know, that... Uh, you know, maybe you got a question. Am I going to go to that gathering? Which yeah. leads me to the the final topic I want to close on here is don't be afraid to create new sober friendly traditions. You know, yeah. people know when they come to my house, if we have a gathering uh, and we have had people over that, that drink is don't bring it to my house. Yeah. Like it's my house. Yeah. You know, um, enjoy this with us in this capacity and we're not forcing and we also don't judge like. No, it's Thanksgiving and I want to have some wine or whatever. Okay, no offense. We're not offended. Yeah, please do you. Do you, do your holiday wherever you want. But in our home, that's our way. Yeah, that's uh, exactly how my parents do it. Yeah. yeah. And um, I I think that the 12-step stuff is really important, especially in new when you're newly sober. For me, the first year of sobriety, I did like 10 meetings a week for the whole year. And um, I remember on... 
Thanksgiving, I was still living in sober living. My family, we had Thanksgiving at my house. And my cousin had just had his first child and was like, bro, even now that kid still is so noisy. But I remember it was like really pissing me off then. So I went to the um, like Alcathon where they had 24 for 24 hours. There was a meeting constantly. And so I went and stayed there for like three hours and then went back home for another hour. Then went back to the meeting before I went back to the sober living and for the first year actually after that i started going to all the um like alcathons and narcathons and all that stuff yeah. like because i i it was kind of like you said just building new sober traditions and i met a bunch of people there and started that that was a big way of how i met people and grew a very vast network of of friends you know and a lot of the people I hardly talk to, but I would see them every every holiday. I'd see them at whatever meeting, you know. Yeah. And sometimes now I'll see them at, at different meetings, and it's it's really good to be familiar when someone like recognizes you at a meeting and you haven't seen them in a long time. Like that's what made me feel like AA was my home, and that was somewhere I needed to be because I didn't have that in a lot of other places. I didn't have that feeling of the only time i had that was when i was selling drugs to people and they'd be happy to see me right you know, other than that of course most, you're most giving of them their fix yeah, man most time people weren't happy to see me so that was very moving to, to me and just really imp- important at that time it is and and we do need that you know that shift i know for me it's like nice when uh when I show up to church on sunday or something and one of the pastors, he's in a long-term recovery, and you know he's all like me, all you know, tatted up, you know, got his knuckles and hands, you know, and here he <laughs> comes up. Oh, so good to see! Like, I love that kind of stuff. There's, there's a gentleman, older gentleman there that knows I love motorsports, and so before I even get in the door, he's like, oh, what's going on? Formula One, you know. <laughs> so we sit. We need those kind of things, and if yeah. we can get that shift of an environment that it's. Because we got to get away from that thing of, of of the delusion that we have friendship in getting our fix. Yeah, my mom always don't. says that uh, re- recovery is the or wait, was it addiction is the opposite of connection? Yes, and it's true. It, it is when you get like connected. That's really when you feel whole. You yeah. feel like you aren't alone and you can do it. You know, because that was the biggest thing when I was using was I just felt so empty and alone. Yeah. Felt well, like no one would like there was no hands to reach out to even though i had a, a ton of people who would have loved to help me i just still had that feeling of like no one understands no one will actually knows what i'm going through no one can really help me yeah well and it's that the the and it always starts out with the delusion and illusion that we are getting connection exactly but at the end of the day i know for me if i was out drinking i definitely would there was nothing authentic and genuine about my intentions of being in that environment. It was either to get plastered, hopefully somebody will take care of me and get me home, (laughs) uh, and or to to hook up with some girl. Maybe it's one I already had, maybe a new one, whatever. My intentions were never evident and pure, and that can lead us to such loneliness because we're just playing a character. Yeah. Um, And that's the dangers of it. So that's why I really say, you know, closing with that topic, start your new ones, like you said. Going to those those you know so alcoholic events. anonymous you know marathons whatever it is, like be willing, um, and maybe like if a stranger reached out to me and said, "Hey, I've seen what you're doing. I live in town. I'm so uncomfortable going to a meeting. Um, what would be your recommendation? Be like, this is a meeting. Where do you need me to pick you up? Yeah. I'll take you and introduce." you to people like sometimes yeah. you know our shyness is is there a lot of us i had yeah. to drink i'm not naturally an extrovert yeah me neither. you know but when i would i was like oh yeah and everybody oh yeah. that guy's confident no i was a jackass yeah. um, <laughs> belligerent <laughs> yeah belligerent oh yeah it just took a little time yeah. uh so whatever it is you know don't be afraid to do that have someone help get you involved with something let them know it's part of that support and vulnerability just like it's not my strong suit, but can you help me kind of get acclimated? Because I know what you mean when you show yeah. up to a meeting, even if it's been like a month or something, yeah. and I'll show up to, I don't go as frequently as I used to. Um, but if I show up 
there's like five people smiling like man so good to see you yeah and it and that's it good yeah that genuine love that you get from people um it's priceless yeah and i think it's important to not be afraid to talk to people because i was afraid when i first got sober like what if this person doesn't like me what if i say the wrong thing and they don't want to talk to me ever again but especially people that you see that are active in the community reach out to those people because they love it yeah. they love it every time they're excited for new people to talk yeah. to them and that's the stuff that will be the most beneficial like um, on halloween they had this thing down in downtown fresno where it was like a halloween party sober halloween party and it was like family friendly they have bounce houses for the kids and all this stuff and going to that i remember like i went to it the first year and i was with a group of friends and i felt super nervous to talk to anyone outside of my group of friends and at that time it was like i think it was right when i had a year and i still had that anxiety of Mm -hmm. talking to people i didn't know because there were so many people i didn't know there but I talked to one guy who I hadn't met before and I saw him doing a lot of activities like setting stuff up and I knew he was very involved I went and talked to him and he was like super excited that I was talking to him and I remember that that feeling of like oh wow I'm not bothering this guy like it's actually a good thing was yeah. was really nice and I just recommend that to everyone else to really reach out to people no matter who it is and if you have time reach out to the people that are new because they're yeah. probably too scared to do it but they want someone to come ask for that connection yeah and people who if you're new and, and you see people that are active and especially the people that are active by anyone but especially the people that are active they're always the most pleasant and and they're really excited to meet new people yeah. and get new people involved yeah i mean and then if you're in and around the uh, central valley around the fresno area i'm up in the merced county and you're seeing and hearing this send us an email the email's in there and just say hey i want to get connected i guarantee you julian myself like <laughs> we'll, we'll give you a call or an email back or if you reach out through social media we'll figure it out we'll help you get yeah. to, to a meeting maybe if it's your first time or you've you've gone but you know it didn't work out you know don't be afraid you know we that's what we do like like we're excited to give back yeah, you know so anything else you want to add reach out people that's it that's it all right hey thanks for uh, either happy watching holidays happy <laughs> holidays right uh thanks for either watching on youtube of course it's at pain nonprofit on youtube please uh like this video leave some comments down below maybe there's some tips that julian and i missed that really help you uh leave them down there to help out other people and uh, please if you got value out of the podcast uh, share it with others and don't forget we're also on apple podcast and spotify all you got to do is search parents and addicts in need if you or a loved one is struggling with addiction please call pain parents and addicts in need at 559-579-1551 or visit us online at painnonprofit.org. follow us on social media on facebook Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Pain Nonprofit. And please subscribe to the Don't Hide the Scars podcast and share with others wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. And if you would like to donate to Pain, Parents and Addicts in Need, please click the link in the description to make your tax deductible donation today and help us save more lives gripped by addiction.